Hello students, this is Alan Boris coming to you from my office in the Anthropology Lab here at Kenai Peninsula College and today we are going to go over the historic Cook Inlet events with an anthropological focus approximately from where we left off 1867 uh, in the last lecture to some recent times obviously in doing such a lecture we can't cover all of the events that happened uh, during that time period uh, it's uh, that would be a whole course in itself and I have taught that course by the way but uh, this will focus on fish history particularly salmon fishing history and we'll I'll put in a few uh, events and uh, for your consideration uh, that are tangentially related to that um, but we will focus in particular on salmon history. So we left off uh, talking about American Purchase and just to remind you that the sale of Alaska to the United States involved a number of events that uh, Cook Inlet was uh, played a big part in. We talked about the Russian America Company's inability to feed themselves relating back to Baranov's decision to put his mainland capital in southeast Alaska at Sitka rather than somewhere in Cook Inlet where the situation would have been much different. This also resulted in overextended communication and transportation problems uh, having to uh, sail all the way from Siberia from the Russian Far East to southeast uh, was quite a bit different than the much shorter route to somewhere in south central Alaska and we talked about the fear of a gold rush the discovery on the Kenai Peninsula primarily by Derosian Russian mining engineer of gold and uh, at the same in the same era the California gold rush was happening and thousands of miners were coming West to make it rich, and if word got out of gold in Alaska while the Russians held on to the territory, then uh, they would have been overwhelmed and likely would have received nothing from their efforts here in Alaska. All of this stemming from the fact that the population was only about six to eight hundred Russians, and as uh, because of their inability to feed themselves in a Western manner. So we'll move on, uh, and so we have a number, there's a number of events that we won't talk about, a number of themes that are important in the whole story. Uh, as I said, we will talk about fish, and these are in no particular order, so we can start from the lower left. Uh, one is coal mining. Uh, this is the ma a railroad that went out to the end of the spit in Homer. There were also later coal mines in Sutton and then further north out of our area that we're talking about but uh, coal mines so coal was significant but not overly significant most of the coal uh, in south central Alaska is a relatively low grade meaning it's uh, bituminous much of it subbituminous much of it lignite as a consequence it doesn't burn very hot and you have to have a lot of it in order to make an equivalent amount of heat and it creates a lot of ash and so on so it's not of high quality so much of the coal mining was not of great significance uh, in Alaska in South Central Alaska we jump to tourism here's a boat in the harbor in Seward uh, but tourism has been a theme throughout Alaska throughout this late 1800s even and early uh, and 1900s uh, 20th century and of course into the 21st century so tourists uh, and that's a theme in the top left is gold mining and that's uh, there's hydraulic mining that's a chute of uh, water that they're washing away a stream bed and then sluicing it on down traditional way of mining placer gold there also were hard rock mines on the Kenai Peninsula at least for gold and gold mining was significant in the early 1900s um, the particularly around Hope and Sunrise with cities as large as 7,000 or so 
springing up overnight and then disappearing. But it, uh, it, my corporations or companies took over mining into the, up to the, uh, up to about World War One. At which point, uh, because of the war effort, many of the mines were not uh, run, and they just were not um, uh, economically. Um, um, viable and so most of them were closed down. Uh, on the other hand there's oil and of course this is the now historic photo of the uh, of the plant uh, in um, Nikiski, the Agrium plant which is now closed down. I took this picture probably in the 1980s sometime when it was going full tilt. But nevertheless, oil in Alaska is very significant. It drives our economy, uh, and oil uh, in Cook Inlet has been very significant, particularly from 1957 on. And uh, that's an important part of the story in relation to land use issues and other sorts of issues. To jump back to an earlier time, um, sport hunting was a, was a significant issue. Uh, the Kenai Peninsula was discovered in the late 1800s, early 1900s, particularly in 19, mid-1920s. 1923, the Alaska Railroad was built. That brought access to the Kenai, to Kenai Lake, and that brought access to the Kenai River. And also there was access at an earlier time via the canneries. So many uh, European and wealthy American sport hunters came to the Kenai Peninsula and to uh, the other side of the inlet and uh, to the upper inlet areas for big moose, big bears, big game, trophy hunting particularly. And if you were to track that story, you would find the Denina were, um, were, were significant in helping those people find the big uh, racks that they were after. Lower uh, right is Soldatna, and I show it uh, as Soldatna about 1950. Soldatna is a homesteading town. You could argue that Wasilla is a homesteading town, Palmer a homesteading town, uh, Homer uh, had its homesteading days, as did Anchorage. All many of the major towns on the peninsula had uh, a spurt of activity. Uh, Post-World War II through homesteading uh, on the Kenai Peninsula, it lasted about 10 years when oil, 1957 oil developments, uh, eclipsed homesteading as an activity and many of the homesteads turned into subdivisions. Um, but homesteading has that legacy. Uh, it was uh, many um, uh, veterans of World War II were given preference and uh, that really transformed the landscape in significant ways uh, but never really worked as as agricultural production um, and again because uh, subdivisions and population growth tended to uh, take over some of the best potential agricultural land in Alaska. This is early Anchorage, and uh, that's a part of the story, and that's population growth, really an exponential population growth. So you can think uh, things not changing a whole lot up to World War II. After World War II, an increasing population growth and really just booming in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and now to where we are today. This is all in Denina territory. This is Denina country, so Denina country is that indigenous territory in Alaska that has the largest non-native population anywhere. And Denina have been seeking answers to uh, the question of how to be an indigenous tribe, how to be an indigenous people in the midst of a larger population and a larger society and uh, have, have found, I think, a lot of answers in how we all should live as uh, members of a group. So these are all themes. They're important themes. I don't want to minimize them by not covering them in detail. But uh, of, of these, uh, and there's no slide of it here, but of these, the theme of the day, salmon um, 
uh, salmon fisheries of various sorts will be the will be what we'll talk about. But we should talk about some other events. So the Alaska Purchase was in 1867, and in 1869 the uh, uh, U.S. Army was sent to Kenai to establish uh, what became Fort Kenai. That's how it was spelled. That's not my own misprint. K-E-N-A-Y. They established um, four posts in Alaska, one at Kodiak, the one at Sitka they took over from the Russians, and later one at Wrangell, and the one at Kenai. Uh, they sent a ship called the Torrent uh, with the troops from the 2nd Battalion uh, from Fort Vancouver in Washington north to find Kenai and establish a post there. They stopped in Kodiak in 1868 and went to went north then in to establish the post at Kenai. Incredibly they didn't know where Kenai was. Now admittedly Kenai was a very small native village at the time. This map uh, says road to and that's gonna it's off the map here but it's road to native village and that's Kituk, which was the village there. And this is the Russian post here. Here, here, and here. And there probably were some associated buildings with that. So <laughs> they should have known where it is, but they started poking around Kachemak Bay looking for Kenai and got caught in the tides in Port Graham and ran aground on some rocks at the entrance to Port Graham. The ship went down. It was a total loss and the men made it ashore. No one no one died. The local Alutig certainly helped them out and uh, probably um, got them through some tough times for I think it was a couple of weeks and finally somebody a mail boat, I think it was, uh, was sailing in, found them. They went back to Kodiak for the winter and the next spring actually found Kenai, got a little better directions and established this post. Uh, a lot of outbuildings in the manner of a late 1860s post. So there's a, a legend that goes along with these. These are barracks, blacksmith shops, storage areas, places where they kept their muskets, uh, all of that sort of thing, typical of a post of a couple hundred men. There were a significant number of people. Where it says D here, these are gardens, gardens along the bluff in Kenai, and incredibly a parade ground. Uh, I've got all the, um, court, um, all the fort records and they start out having reveille, I think at 6 a.m. And the first thing they do is go out and march and they get breakfast. About, I don't know, a month later, the commander says, uh, we're gonna move uh, reveille to 6.30 and they go out and march. Anyway, as it moves along, they gradually move reveille up from up to about eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I guess there's no one to check on them here in Alaska. The marching must have puzzled the Denina from Skitook. I imagine them coming over to watch people march in this relative wilderness. So sending the military was, was sort of the um, uh, typical of occupation in westward expansion for the United States. First comes the military, then often comes the missionaries, then often comes the um, the trading post or sometimes the trading post and then the missionaries and then eventually the teachers. All part of an assimilation process but the first thing you have to have is natives that are not hostile. And so they came and they prepared themselves to uh, pacify the Denina, uh, but they found that the Denina were not hostile to, the, to Fort Kenai. And so in two years they packed everything up except the buildings and they left and were sent to Idaho 
and I believe there they would have been fighting the Nez Perce and Chief Joseph uh, as part of the Indian Wars, so Battery F uh, never really made much of a dent. The buildings were left abandoned, and some of them might still be around in Old Town Kenai. So that's Fort Kenai. They came, they found it eventually, they built, and they left. Here's Kenai in the late 1800s, so this would have been uh, what places around Cook Inlet might have looked like. Uh, this is uh, now a notched version here of the Nachilsh. I went and uh, covered up the notches for you, but that would be the Nichilsh now notched. Uh, this is birch bark here, so that was another version of a, of a dwelling, and this is, has the characteristics of a birch bark dwelling. Um, poles and then this birch bark siding, so to speak. Now the caches are above ground caches, so they're built on stilts, sort of the typical cache that we think of when we think of Alaska not the below ground caches and very likely this would have been possible because of axes that allowed you to notch the corners um, but also probably access to some storage um, or some trading trade goods that could be stored uh, without having to be frozen all the time as in the below ground caches so Kenai and the other villages around Cook Inlet probably looked something like this. There's the metal stove pipe, so that's that's uh, being replaced. So now we get to fish. The most significant event in Alaska uh, during the late 1800s and early 1900s was not the gold rush. In individual places, the gold rush was certainly significant. In Nome, it was significant. In Fairbanks, it was significant. Uh, in Eagle, it was significant. But for the most part, and primarily in coastal Alaska, the most important transforming agent was commercial salmon canning. So this is the second cannery built in Alaska. The first was built in southeast Alaska the year before, I believe, 1881. And this is the second built at the mouth of the Kasilof River, not far from where I live. Commercial canning was developed, some say in Europe, uh, others say other places, but the process of canning was uh, invented, if you will, sometime in the 1840s. Eventually it was applied to fish on the Grand Banks of Newfoundland and it was successful and it jumped to the west coast of the United States, particularly in the Columbia River area, uh, where again it was very successful and then jumps to Alaska, where it was also successful. These were large uh, uh, organizations. Much of the money behind the, or the capital behind the c uh, commercial canning interests came from railroad money. The big railroad barons who had made millions in building the railroads of the West had the capital and invested that capital in a number of things including uh, commercial canning because you had to do a lot of things you had to not only build the buildings, but you had to get the crew up, pay the crew, uh, all of the facilities that went inside, the boilers and all of that sort of thing. It was a considerable investment and it was the railroad money or related money that had the capital to do that. Initially they didn't buy the land. There was, you might say there was no one to buy the land from. Um, that had not been resolved. Land claims were not an issue. They just plopped them down at the best spots. And in Cook Inlet, the best spots were near the major rivers, in this case the Kasilof, and later it jumped to some of the other rivers. So, uh, hmm, 
excuse me, I've got a blank screen here. I'm going to try to go back. Let's try that again. <sighs> okay. So here are some of the men. So men come north. Um, the system uh, was that uh, primarily uh, workers from San Francisco, later Seattle, uh, a lot of Scandinavians, a lot of Americans, a few British, a, few, a lot of Italians, uh, single men, or if they were married their wives did not come with them, came north to work in the uh, canning um, industry. They uh, primarily built the fish traps and managed the tenders that uh, for the cannery or were blacksmiths and other kinds of had other kinds of specialty uh, work ran the boats these sorts of things some natives were hired as well here's uh, a native man here I think I counted three on this picture there's another um, I can't find the other one. Might be this guy back here. At any rate, not many, but a few. And the third contingent were the Chinese cannery workers who worked the gut line. So in Cook Inlet, it was primarily traps. I'll show you pictures of traps in a little bit. Uh, and uh, and here's the product. So. Looking at this under a magnifying glass in this upper picture here, those boxes say Cook Inlet Salmon. So here we have salmon being shipped out and new people coming in. Most of the people did not come to stay. They'd come up on the ships in the summer, do their work, go back on the ships in the fall. Uh, but some stayed. Eventually some stayed and that was had a population effect on the area and uh, sometimes it was just men who unmarried men who stayed sometimes they married native women um, and uh, had a population effect but either way new ideas were being brought into the area and as will develop new power new power in terms of social power and fish are shipped out so uh, one way to approach this is from the standpoint of what is called world system theory or maybe better world system analysis. It's not really a theory. And essentially it says that um, that resources of a, of a colonized area, resources are shipped out and power and control is shipped in. And so we have a two-way street here and uh, if uh, you you could if you've studied world system theory or world system analysis uh, you could look at Cook Inlet in those terms the resource that's being shipped out of course is salmon and it went not just to the United States but it really went worldwide I mean these were highly sought after products highly nutritious and uh, relatively inexpensive and uh, new ideas new people coming in So canneries spread very quickly in Cook Inlet. Uh, of course, they spread other places as well. They spread in Kodiak. They spread in Bristol Bay. Uh, salmon canning becomes the major industry very quickly in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and to today. I mean, uh, the commercial industry is still around, still a major player in the economics of Alaska, said to be one of the highest employing uh, industries in Alaska today. So these are just a few pictures of canneries. This is uh, the previous one was at Kasilov. In the upper left here is a cannery built at uh, Kenai. This is the one also built at Kenai. This is the old Libby McNeil and Libby cannery. This building is this building right here. Uh, really very nostalgic places. Most of them not operated today as they were uh, during the heyday of the canning industry. In fact, canning I guess is making a bit of a comeback, but it's primarily fresh frozen salmon that is the product today. 
All of these canneries in Cook Inlet operated initially by uh, salmon traps. The uh, later, as the drift uh, fleet emerged, drifting a net in the inlet, other canneries developed, and these are canneries down here in the lower left in Kachemak Bay. So uh, this uh, Kachemak Bay doesn't lend itself to fish traps because of the fjorded irregular coastline and other places where there's an irregular coastline didn't lend itself to the type of fish traps that were very effective in Cook Inlet. And this next slide shows some of those fish traps. So uh, the way they work is the fish come along and uh, this is this one's at relatively high tide and they're diverted. Uh, this is a mesh. Uh, well, usually it's like wire, like chicken wire, probably heavier than chicken wire, but like that. They're diverted up this. Uh, there's a term for it. I can't remember what. They can't go around or they don't want to go around. So they end up going into this. It's called pot. And these, I believe they're called balers, would have been down in the water. And they let the fish fill up. And eventually they fill up. And they raise these, and then the tender comes, and they dump the fish into the tender, and off the tender goes to the cannery. Uh, here's one at low tide. Here are some men rebuilding the trap. They had to be rebuilt every every spring because the winter ice going back and forth would shear them off. Poles were pulled up, and they were re-driven as traps. Uh, so that was one of the major jobs in the spring uh, as the peak men came back up. Uh, traps were vilified in the statehood issue for Alaska because Alaska statehood uh, had to do with um, access to fish. So the canneries uh, owned the fish trap sites and the fish traps were licensed to the canneries. Uh, so no one, or very few, let's say, there were a few that were privately owned, but they were in not very good locations. So no one who wasn't a cannery could get access to salmon. So uh, as we'll point out later, one of the first acts of the Alaska State Legislature was to make fish traps illegal. So in the debate over statehood, fish traps were vilified. They were condemned as destroying the fish runs. And that may have happened in places like the Karlik River and Kodiak, and it may have happened in other places in southeast Alaska where unscrupul unscrupulous cannery men might block the whole uh, access to the streams, uh, block the whole thing and just take all the fish and, and destroy the runs. But as far as I can tell, it never happened in Cook Inlet and in fact was very efficient uh, because to go back to this fish trap, let me erase what I've got here. Erase this one here. When the, uh, when there, when the cannery was full to capacity with, in the gut line, uh, they simply lifted these things and the fish would be diverted and swim on through. And on they'd go up to spawn. So they were quite uh, efficient and uh, quite effective as well. Very selective in uh, how they operated. So fish traps. The fish were then taken to the cannery and uh, here is the inside of the cannery. This, these photos were taken uh, in the late 1890s of that same cannery in Kasilov. So this is the gut line here. I don't know which way it's going here, but at any rate the men would stand on either side and they would be in the early days almost exclusively Chinese labor and they would be um, they would be required to to cut about four to six fish a minute and so one man made I think it's six cuts initially and then on it went down the line four to six cuts a minute 
very tedious work. As we'll see in a moment, they were required to work long shifts and uh, they had some breaks, but not many. Uh, men who were uh, young boys at the time the canneries operated in Kenai uh, used to, they were told never to go near what was called the China House uh, where the where the workers and by that time they might have been Filipinos uh, but where the Chinese workers stayed and on break they would peek in the window they would say and see them smoking uh, smoking I'm not sure if it was heroin or what it was they were smoking but it was a drug, and it was not. Uh, they were it was not a recreational activity. Uh, they were probably hugely stressed out by this intense uh, work, uh, intensely difficult work. So it was medicinal in nature. Uh, most of the men were in their 40s or 50s. Some were as old as 60. Uh, most had worked in the building the railroads and now they were shifted to the canneries. We'll come back to them in a second, but the product was then put in cans and pushed into these retorts where the canning actually took place, so they had to have a lot of coal. Coal was brought up from outside to run the retorts, and uh, out they came. I think there was a second cooking as well then put into packs, labels put on, and off they went to the world. Uh, this is a picture of the Korea, a ship that came to Cook Inlet. Uh, then here are the, some of the Chinese workers uh, on that ship. Here is a cemetery. It's at the mouth of the Kenai River with a marker, cemetery marker. There's three in this area, a little picket fence, and uh, this writing uh, says something like uh, the person's name and they died at this spot. The operation was run by what has been called the Chinese Mafia, uh, and uh, as I said, most of the men had come to uh, America as part of railroad labors and uh, were sending their money back home. They weren't here to make make a go of it as far as uh, entrepreneurs and upward mobility and all that. They were supporting their families back in China. This is a copy of the contract. This particular one is Ah King, and he was a one of these cannery bosses or cannery mafia bosses. He probably never came to Alaska. Uh, this is a little bit later, but they actually had a contract. But here's the working conditions. I'll read it to you. It might be hard to read on your screen. Ah King Company's cannery rules and regulations. All employees in our canneries must be ready at any time to obey our foreman's orders for work. If any employee should refuse to comply with the foreman's orders or refuse to work, he will be charged 50 cents per hour for each and every hour that he stops work, and his board shall be charged for at the rate of 50 cents per meal, set amounts to be deducted from their season's wages. Uh, and to insert, that was a lot of money in those days, uh, where a dollar a day might be a lot. The work is to consist of 11 hours each day to be performed between the hours of 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. All work, so they got a little break for lunch, all work done at either hours, uh, in, in other hours or days, and at any time on Sunday to be overtime, at the rate of 25 cents per hour. All injuries or death incurred while en route to and from the cannery at the China House or while working in the cannery shall be at the employee's own risk and we will not be liable for any damages or any claim from any of the above causes. In case of fire or other uh, reasons or for any other reasons, employees of this cannery are to be transferred to another cannery. 
by this company's orders with no changes in wages or time that was agreed upon heretofore. And there it's placed to sign it. It was written in English and in Chinese. Um, however, almost certainly almost all of the men were illiterate both in English and in Chinese. So these were pretty uh, stringent rules. Uh, there's a reason we have labor laws today, both in terms of hours worked and no liability. If anything happened, they were out of luck. Uh, an unjust system and not a, not a pretty system. A system that we in Alaska uh, should not be proud of. Uh, uh, much of the, the relatively cheap wage, or cheap price, pardon me, of the, of the salmon pack was on the backs of the Chinese laborers who worked long, hard hours for little pay. Uh, I worked it out once that for a summer, uh, the San Francisco-based, uh, largely white cannery workers got about $350 a season. The native workers got about half that, and the Chinese workers got about half of that half for a season. So they were not making a lot of money certainly in relation to the rest. The uh, materials came up on ships like this. This particular ship is, notor is of notoriety because it ran aground, so it's called the Korea, and there's still a Korea bend. Uh, so all of the tin plate, all of the coal, all of the tin plate was for the cans that came up flat and then it was rounded. All of that came up uh, on these ships and the Chinese workers and the white workers. And then, of course, they would ship back the pack in the fall. But this one ran aground, a Captain Wheeler. Uh, I don't know if that's Captain Wheeler here or not, uh, but he seems pretty lonely and uh, we can't fault him. These were tough, this was tough water to, man to manage a sailing ship of this size. Uh, with the tides here, but uh, he writes in the rec report, they had to file a rec report, ran aground on the bar south of Calgon Island, on the next tide floated her and ran her in sinking condition to the east side and beached her. Probably thinking as he wrote, end of career. Well, I hope uh, we Captain Wheeler uh, survived. So, what's the outcome of this? So, what emerged around 1900 in Cook Inlet is a three-tiered, or four-tiered, if you will, but at least three-tiered structure. Um, the um, Chinese workers are written out of this because almost none of them ever stayed. I don't think any of them stayed. Not that I found, anyway. That wasn't true later with Filipino workers. Some did stay and marry in, but uh, early uh, not so with the Chinese workers. But what did stay are white people or there was an emerging class structure. Uh, so here's Cap here's H.M. Weatherby in this upper photo. He's in this house up here, which is was at the mouth of the Kasilov and was moved by the Kasilov Historical Society to their historic grounds about a mile up the uh, Kalifornsky Beach Road uh, from the Sterling Highway and here's his wife and daughter and uh, another woman that's his wife I believe daughter and another woman and here's H.M. Wheeler so he's the head of the cannery he uh, makes decisions that are tantamount, tantamount to be judge and jury he decides who gets jobs, who doesn't get jobs, what the pay is. He makes a lot of decisions that involve uh, running of the cannery, but also running of the area. And he's at the top of the social heap, if you will. He's the top of the social structure, along with other people who later emerged, like uh, the sheriff, the school teachers, um, the man who ran the boilers, who was a very skilled, that was a skilled position, 
and later others as the infrastructure of places like uh, like Kenai emerged and they became at the top of the social strata. Next in line were uh, men who came and stayed. Uh, this uh, is Andrew Berg over here. Wait, I gotta get my pen. Here we go. That's Andrew Berg. Uh, he was a Swedish speaking Finn. A lot of the men who came were from that part of Finland that is Swedish speaking and he and his brother came. Um, men of great skill, men of great wilderness skills, jack of all trades, worked in the fishing industry, worked in as miners, worked as trappers, worked as carpenters, worked in a lot of different things. Berg had a cabin at the head of Tustamina Lake where he lived by himself much of the year, uh, much of the winter, pardon me, um, and uh, trapped and other sorts of things. Not, however, community builders. Berg himself was not never married and he did have a place in Kenai but not active in building a community. This man I take to be of Scandinavian or at least Northern European uh, descent and will take this to be his wife and he marries into Denina uh, society and I'm not sure if these are his kids or uncle and who or who everyone else is here, but it was typical often for Denina women to marry uh, men who had um, moved to Alaska. And these together become the second rung of Denina society. And the third rung and the lowest rung are the indigenous families. So this picture on the lower left was taken at Kenai by this man, H.M. Weatherby, and uh, I think the eyes tell a very, uh, tell a story of what it feels like to be a, not second, but third class citizen in your own homeland. The power structure shifts as a consequence of canneries coming in. Uh, now power shifts to newcomers who have only lived here a short time, but who have connections to the salmon canning industry. And the Denina become third class citizens in their homeland. And so this is, um, this is a story of, that the Denina have been dealing with uh, really to this day. And uh, how to emerge as uh, fully, uh, fully uh, equal and uh, recognized as the indigenous people of this place. One of the most significant recent events in South Central Alaska, I think it's symbolic, but has been the naming of the Denina Center, the convention center in downtown Anchorage as the Denina Center, giving recognition to the indigenous people of this place. Yes, it's only a name, but on the other hand, it gives recognition that these are the indigenous people. And uh, further efforts to tell the story, such as this class of Denina in this area and the remarkable story that it is, are also part of that um, uh, sort of reversing, uh, the reversing class suppression that started back in these times. This is a graph that I did that uh, this is time here on the bottom. This goes from 1880 to 1940. We could extend it on, but the red is exported salmon. And salmon go up and down uh, because of economic factors. Um, this is World War I, for example, right in here. Um, but uh, but uh, and gradually increase. Uh, correlates with uh, the white population, that's the green line here, which gradually increases. And it's not until, a, uh, well, yeah, it gradually increases. 
The black line then is denying a population, and this is this horrendous drop here is the influenza epidemic of 1918-1919 in that era, which never really recovered until um, fairly recent times. So we got fish going out, and we got white people folks coming in, and the Denina are being impacted in a number of ways, not directly by the salmon, but indirectly by the diseases associated with the salmon. And that's what I talked about when we talked about the salmon wars and how people, uh, Denina people were trying to deal with what really amounts to this right in here, this time period right there. And here for you math fans, here's another way to just visualize the same thing. This is exported salmon along the, what is that, x-axis. And the green line is the non-native or white population plotted as, uh, plotted exponentially. And the black line is the Denina population. So one goes up, the other goes down. And quite a remarkable correlation here. Again, it's not causal, we're not ca we're not, but we're saying it has to do with events that are associated with the coming of new people uh, and the exporting of a product from this area. Colonization, in other words. Colonization now uh, is exacerbated in terms of Denina territory, whereas it wasn't during Russian times, largely because of the Battle of Kenai. This uh, woman's picture was taken at the mouth of the Kasilov River. Um, I just put it up uh, because I, I think it's such a remarkable photo and what she must have lived through. So this picture was taken in the late 1800s, about 1885, 1886, somewhere in that area, probably by Weatherby. And uh, uh, possibly she's blind, but what she must have experienced in her lifetime, going from, going from the early 1800s to when this photo was taken. This is also a photo taken at the cannery at the mouth of the Kasilov River. And I want to I want to use this photo to talk about uh, a process that is sometimes called debt peonage. So these three Dedina men, probably from Kalifornsky Village or possibly from Humpy Point, two nearby villages, are pictured here uh, at the cannery. And they have Western clothes except for the foot gear. And this man is holding a rifle, an octagonal barrel Winchester rifle, probably an 1894 model, octagonal barrel Winchester rifle, or one like it. At the time, it would have been about $20, uh, and ammunition would have been about $2 a box. Uh, and so we have the transition into a money economy, but a transition into a money economy uh, perpetrated by credit. Credit. He uh, probably did not save up for that rifle. That would have taken a lot of years. He probably bought it on credit. So here uh, is a page, uh, a photocopy of a page from the inventory of the Alaska Commercial Company, the debt records of 1899. So these are the Denina, and you'll have to take my word for it. On the left-hand margin, it says something like um, not collectible. Um, they don't think they're going to get their money from the, these uh, uh, natives, uh, Denina, from the area. So here's Laurenta. He owes $126. Here's Big Stepanka. He owns 50, owes $51. So on down the line, Ivemka owes $114. The chiefs probably were helping out their people, so that's why they had more. A few, no, not so much. So Sasha took $6. Uh, here's Nikolai Chikaloon, $61, and so on. So the, there was credit, and I've been tracking these records. 
someday I'll get my act together and publish it all but what was emerging was a system where they were getting credit 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 and eventually couldn't pay now not everyone bought into this so to speak no pun intended uh, uh, but many did um, so this was a standard practice. This was uh, this was one of the men who would have given that credit. And I believe it's the man on the left uh, that he's talking to a ship captain. Uh, but this was Dawson. Dawson. Dawson was manager of one of the trading posts in Kenai in the and he moved around. I think something similar. I think he was up in the upper inlet. Uh, a guy named Palmer was up in the upper inlet as well. He ran a trading post. Um, there were numerous trading posts um, around. Trading post at Kinnick another, was another one. Um, these were all uh, giving credit and that meant you had to pay off that debt. You only had two ways to pay off that debt. Uh, and one way was through fur trade. This is actually from a little earlier. This is from 1871, and this is Alaska Commercial Company records in 1871. But here's the type of furs and the price range for those furs that uh, were being uh, traded at the at the store. Uh, one of the biggest ones was Martin Parkas. Uh, which fetched about six dollars for a particular parka and there was a lot of them being made a lot of them 900 uh, martin parkas for a total of over five thousand uh, dollars the other big item were beaver so beaver got two dollars a pelt but apparently there were a lot of them 725 in may and over six thousand dollars in beaver a lot of money a lot of money for those days. Black bear uh, were not much, five one to five dollars, twenty-five, but still seventy-seven dollars. Black fox, one hundred and fifty-eight dollars total, and so on down the line. So this was one way that men, mostly men, but I would assume women would be involved in parka making, uh, could pay back their debt or achieve money to buy new items at the trading store. Either way it tended to take them out of the traditional uh, Denina fishing um, subsistence economy because they had to uh, undertake work for the uh, for in trapping in the winter in order to pay off their debt in the summer and of course they were dependent on fur uh, prices from outside outside of the local area in, in the United States and in Europe and in the late um, 1800s for the fur trade crashed it just wasn't worth much anymore and so this was not a good vehicle by which to pay back your debt the other vehicle was to work in the cannery and uh, and here I is a page from an Alaska resident fishermen's union uh, attempt to unionize the fishermen who worked for the cannery. Uh, I'll just read a few of these inscriptions here. Um, so this is number 32. <coughs> Excuse me. This is F.M. Back to it, age 26, born in Kenai, married to Ella Miller, age uh, 18. I have two children to support. I fish two months cleared eleven dollars after paying my bills so the bills and how much he's making here number 33 is Manuel Darien age 29 married to Doris Wilson age 18 I have one child to support I worked for Snug Harbor Packing Company for two and a half months at ninety dollars per month when I paid my bills I was about even so uh, in both cases, these men are probably going to have to borrow to feed their families for the next year. Uh, here's uh, Nick Kalifornski. That's Peter's father. Age 51, born in Kenai. For, he was actually born in Kalifornski Village, but probably good enough for this purpose. 
four in the family to support, employed at Libby McNeil and Libby, paid my bills and was about even. And there's his signature. Peter himself shows up here as number 41. Uh, here's Peter at the time, age 23, born in Kenai, actually again born in Kalifornsky Village, worked for Libby McNeil and Libby one month, made $90, paid expenses, cleared $50. So Peter did pretty well. The point being that most men, and this is just one page of an attempt in 1934 to incorporate as a fisherman's union, uh, was, the people were not making money, so they were continually in debt. So if they had a family, if they had kids, they then had to borrow for the next year uh, to make it through the winter and, of course, then work for the cannery in the summer, and many of them coming out uh, even in a vicious, a vicious circle. So this certainly doesn't uh, ha only occur, didn't only occur in uh, among canneries. This process is called debt peonage. It happened in coal mines. It happened in other kind of company towns. You could say it even happens with modern credit cards. They give you easy credit. You've been approved for a twenty thousand dollar limit. I know you're a freshman in college, but uh, we just like you to be one of our card holders and of course you use it and of course it runs up and of course you have to work then to pay off the credit card and it becomes a vicious vicious circle so it had a transforming effect in Denina territory that effect was that it took men and women and families out of the clan based um, Denina system and individual families then had to work to pay off their debt to the company store, to the credit, to the Alaska Commercial Company, to whoever it was, and move into a cash economy, but not having ready access to the upward mobility that we like to think happens with that cash economy. So the clan system in Cook Inlet tends to disappear. The Denina language tends to disappear. Um, the uh, small villages will tend to disappear because we'll talk later of the influenza epidemic. So uh, canneries had a major transforming impact. That was not true in the Lake Clark area of Denina territory and probably not true in the upper reaches of the Susitna area because of the lack of canneries, because this, there weren't canneries in these interior areas. So today the most traditional Denina areas are in the Nundalton Lake Clark area. Um, language is still uh, of the speakers that remain, that's where the language is spoken, and uh, they uh, sort of go in a different trajectory than the Denina of Cook Inlet itself. Canneries, the transforming effect of canneries. So I want to skip away from fish for a moment and talk about a couple of other things uh, and then we'll get back to fish. Uh, I wanted to uh, mention this because it gives an idea of the impact on the indigenous people of the Cook Inlet area, although this is technically Prince William Sound. On the Kenai Peninsula, Seward emerges as the big town of the early 1900s. So here's a picture of Seward. I forget when this picture was taken, probably about 1910 or so. And uh, because of, eventually then, because of the railroad, becomes a major town, only later eclipsed by Anchorage. Uh, so here's a picture inset here on the in the left of the annual Seward hunt. Now this wasn't unique to Seward. Many places in the West did this, uh, but the te the town would divide itself into two teams. Points were given for different uh, wild foods, wild game. Moose were given. I don't know what uh, ptarmigan. I see some ptarmigan in this picture and other animals. So the town was divided into two teams and off they'd go to kill as much as they could in one weekend. 
and they would. And the team with the most points then got bragging rights for the year. Uh, we hope they used a lot of this, but they almost certainly didn't use all of it. Uh, and what a horrific impact this must have had on indigenous peoples in the area to see wanton waste and, and just for the sake of sport uh, uh, occurring in their own backyards. Um, it didn't last very long, I'm not sure how many years, but at least it happened for several years and uh, had impacts on, on certainly on the native communities. Nothing during the uh, 20th century had as great an impact on the Denina, however, as the influenza epidemic of 1918-1919. This uh, is the tragic consequence of that epidemic. This is the orphanage at Tionic in 1921. These children uh, his parents died in the epidemic a couple of years before. Half the population, half the Denina population died in this time period. Uh, there were other uh, effects as well uh, there, of, of communicable diseases, mumps, chicken pox, other sorts of things like that. Things we hardly think about today because we were vaccinated for mumps and chicken pox, most of us, and and they're not uh, major factors, but they were for native villages that had not built up immunity, and of course there was no vaccination for most things. So uh, that has a great effect, and when we talked about the, uh, the uh, shaman wars, the evil of the evil shaman was influenza. Influenza and that terrible epidemic and how you deal with it. Well, uh, how uh, the Denina tended to deal with it was through indigenized orthodoxy. And we, talk, we spoke, spoke about that in the lecture on, in, on uh, those shaman wars. And here, of course, is the church at Kenai. This is shortly after it was built. It was rebuilt, actually. It became the largest Orthodox church in Cook Inlet until the church in Anchorage was built. But there were also churches in Aklutna and uh, Kanik and uh, other places around in Cook Inlet. Because of the influenza epidemic, um, the... Uh, uh, small villages were abandoned. Villages like Custatan, uh, villages uh, like uh, Nikiski, villages like Point Possession, smaller villages were abandoned and the people tended to move into one of several areas, either Tionic, Kenai, Eklutna, Nundalton, Iliamna, and we could add Kinnick here. I think there was a pretty substantial population that moved into Kinnick. Um, and these became the bigger towns of the early 1900s. Uh, here's Peter Kalifornsky's map of Kenai. Uh, he did from memory, we call it his memory map. Um, he was, we were just, we were team teaching a course actually. And uh, he started talking about where people lived in Kenai, and wow, we should. So at the break, uh, we got some butcher paper and just spread it out on a table and, and began writing furiously where people lived. So there's the Orthodox Church. Over here is Kenai Joe's, still there today. And some of these others are gone, but this is the Denina territory here. This is sometimes called uh, uh, the American area, and over here is the Russian era area. Now it wasn't uh, wasn't exclusive, but this was tended to be where uh, the Denina who moved into Kenai tended to live here, from Kalifornsky Village, from Point Possession. We probably could do a similar map if we could of uh, Old Tionic and other places like that. Uh, just 
what I thought was cool photos of the time period. The caches, as I said earlier, be now become above ground caches. Here's the fish drying. So fish become the theme of this century as well as all previous centuries. Here's some, these are, I don't know what those are, whitefish? Uh, maybe trout. They're not, they don't, they don't look like salmon to me, but this is actually Peter's uncle, Simeon, and uh, Theodore Chickaloosian, very powerful men in Cook Inlet, and that's his father back here. Uh, and we talked uh, about language extinction and the beating of the children for speaking their language. We won't go back through that, but that would have happened at this time period as well. Uh, other events that impacted the Denina negatively. This is the cemetery in Kenai. Uh, a man in the 1930s uh, had come into Kenai, I'm not sure why, but he believed that orthodoxy was satanic. And in the middle of one night, he took a mechanized vehicle, like a little cat or something that there was around, they had around, and he bulldozed all of the graves away. Um, the next morning, the people woke up, and their cemetery was bulldozed into a pile in one corner. They put the grave markers back as best they could remember them, but uh, to this day, when a uh, burial is built at the cemetery in Kenai, people are very cautious because they might run into a mismarked grave. Um, again, a horrific, horrific uh, impact on the people. I show a couple of these pictures just to say it was probably not all terrible good memories of people growing up. Cutting wood, hooligan, they're going to run here soon. So here's Kenai in the 1930s. Other towns would look somewhat similar. Here's the church. Here's the school, American school. The store is here. Uh, this is the first airstrip, so that's how we know about when this was. Uh, and this area is native Kenai, right here. Here, these houses are spaced a little differently. Same out here. But notice how the paths connect all the houses. And that becomes, in my mind, a symbol of community. People are connected. People are connected. Many Denina talk about uh, huge differences that occurred after World War II. Here's before World War II. Uh, problems, yes. Difficulties, yes. But a connected community. But after World War II, things began to fracture. So back to fish. So we can talk about sport fishing. So Alaska Nelly. Um, in 1923, the Alaska Railroad was completed. And that same year, Alaska Nelly built a lodge on Kenai Lake by the railroad and by the lake. And there's, uh, there's she is. And here she is, right here. That's Alaska Nelly. Uh, and she took uh, wealthy um, hunters and fishers. Uh, they came up from Seattle on the boat, from on by railroad from Seward to Alaska Nelly's place, and then by boat again by skiff into the Kenai River drainage to fish and to hunt. So that's how sport fishing starts, and it has never ceased, of course, but as we'll see in a moment in later years, uh, it has got renewed vigor. Fish traps uh, in statehood, we talked about this, so uh, 
I guess that happens in 1959, as you know. So uh, here's the fish trap issue, but I already talked about that. So I'll skip on and just say that, that what emerged after fish traps became illegal uh, was access to fish by individual uh, individuals, creating initially the drift net fishery. So here's, uh, I'm not sure where they are, but here's a drift boat, typical drift boat. And the idea with the crew is you you line out your line and it drifts, catching salmon as they're coming up the inlet. Once it's full, you reel it in and put them in the hold and, and eventually go back to the cannery and unload. And here's the set net fishery up here. Came a little later, but uh, set net, so stake the net on one, st on one side uh, play it out at low tide, at high tide. Um, it floats and the fish are caught. At low tide they're collected again. Or they're simply, you simply go out in the dory and gather them. So these of course are still operating today. Uh, set net fishery and the uh, drift net fishery. And we're leading to controversies. We're leading up to the various user groups that sometimes called that wish to have access to salmon in Cook Inlet. Sport fishing. For reasons I'm not entirely sure of at this point, I'm trying to research it, uh, but in 1973 snagging salmon may, was made illegal in Alaska. It kind of came in two stages, but either way salmon snagging became illegal. Again it was vilified, much like traps were once vilified, snagging was vilified which is kind of curious because they're going to go up and spawn and die anyway. It's not uh, it's not immoral, but uh, I remember going down to the bridge at Soldatna in the early 1970s and watching people with these big treble lures that must have weighed a couple of pounds with all the lead weight, throwing them across the river, lit almost literally throwing them across the river and using this kind of jerking motion to try to snag a salmon as it was moving upstream. Well, that was made illegal in 1973, and fishermen like Spence DeVito, who had learned to fish in upstate New York, uh, began to apply the techniques of, uh, of sport fishing to salmon fishing. And that means movement, the way you move your lure, color, the color of the lure, and smell, the smell of the of the of the lure and the idea is to try to get it to sort of drag in front of the fish who will instinctively snap at it if it's what it's used to eating in terms of color smell and movement and uh, Spence DeVito and others developed these te techniques and the sport fishing industry was born this particular uh, image is one of the most influential of uh, Cook Inlet, I believe. Uh, it's, a, it's not a record salmon. It's not the huge record salmon, but it's a pretty darn big king salmon. And as Spence DeVito told me the story, he had caught that fish in the morning and uh, had brought it home and it was in his yard. And his wife said, gee, that's a great, that's a big fish. We should take a picture of it. So he takes the fish back down to the inlet and he grabs a rod and reel, uh, which was actually not the rod and reel he caught it on. It's actually a little smaller than what he caught it on. Put his waders back on, hefts it up, and she snaps a picture with a little point-and-shoot camera. And uh, he was later showing that picture in somewhere in Soldatna, I can't remember where, when someone from the... Um, Milepost, which is a book that is published for travelers to Alaska, happened to be walk happened to walk in the store. Wow, that's a great picture. Can we can I use that? Well, sure, go ahead. And so it just sort of went viral in pre uh, pre internet days, and uh, this became a, has become a somewhat of an archetype of sport fishing on the Kenai River. Um, 
So this happens in the 70s into the 80s. Uh, I believe there's more meaning than that uh, as typified by this picture. Uh, I'm in my 60s as I give this lecture and might as is Spence DeVito he might be a little older than that um, and my generation the census data would indicate that 80 percent of us are not from here that is we're not born in South Central Alaska born outside and migrated mostly in our 20s sometimes in our 30s migrated to Alaska sort of for work but really for Alaska and uh, things sort of went on. Maybe, maybe you know, the typical story you'll hear people say is, well, I just planned to stay a few years and try it out, but here I am. So that couple of years, you get a job. Wow, that's cool. You got a job. Um, better get a better car. Maybe you buy it on time. Eventually, if you haven't already, you've got a, a significant other and you have a kid. Oh my goodness, we better get a house or build a house. But either way, it costs money. And you find that kid ready to start first grade. And you sit around the kitchen table late at night. Should we stay in Alaska? Or should we go home? Where's home? Home, the concept of home. Many uh, came to Alaska of that 80% not from here with only with a notion of home as being the place they were from. And those who stayed eventually transferred that concept of home to the place they had chosen to live. But I still hear people who have lived here 10, 15, 20, 30 years talk about home not being this place. For others, home is here. So how does that relate to this photo? So the question is then, why live here? So you're from, pick a spot, Oregon or Missouri or wherever and you're describing Alaska. Why live here? Why, why would you want to live there? It's cold, it's dark a lot of the time. And so you pull out this picture of yourself with that big king or whatever. Well, here's one reason. In other words, the this becomes an icon of the reason people live and choose to stay and make home in South Central Alaska. One of the reasons, anyway. Where's home? For many of you listening to this, that's not true anymore. If you're in your 20s, 80% of you were born in Alaska. Where's home is not the question. Your question is why stay? Why stay? Uh, why stay here? We have uh, many forces, popular culture and others, about uh, the good life. And often it result, revolves around, say, the Southern California good life or similar things. Why stay? You have a friend that goes outside to wherever, pick a spot, University of California. See him at the coffee shop. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, well, I'm in the University of California. And, yeah, what are you doing? Well, and you'll hear people say this. I'm only going to UAA. Now I have a long spiel I won't give you right now that I maintain you're going to get a better education someplace like UAA or KPC for that matter because you have a element of the curriculum that no one else has and that's Alaska right outside your door an irreplaceable element of a curriculum where some of the most remarkable things and most difficult questions are being asked and trying to be resolved right now among them fish 
who owns the fish. You don't have that in other places. Iconic image, Spence DeVito. So the sport fishing industry builds up. This is what some people call combat fishing. How amazingly regular people are spaced. Huh. And the boats. These are all boats, drifting boats down the river. Drifting, trying to catch those big salmon. In 1988, the um, Kenichi tribe uh, endeavored to obtain subsistence rights, and it was a huge battle, both within existing subsistence legislation, which is complex to say the least. There's a federal version and a state version, and it was contentious within the tribe itself. Some in the tribe said, "Well, we've you know we're done fighting. We let's just live with it." Uh, we don't need subsistence rights. And others said, yes, we do. And it was contentious. Eventually, a compromise was reached. And in 1988, an educational subsistence net for the Kanaitsi tribe was uh, enacted into law. A single 60-foot net for subsistence. But primarily, it was bitter. Uh, uh, bitter fight within the uh, within the communities of this area. I want to read a uh, opinion piece uh, written by an outdoor writer um, of that time period. This was uh, in 1989, the next year. I write this on June 15th, the first day the Kanaitsi tribe, court order in hand, had their gill net in the Kenai River. I have just returned from watching them catch their first king salmon in that net. As I struggle to put my thoughts on paper, I am seething with anger. This is the first legal gill net in decades to fish the state's most popular sport fishing stream. The Kenai Kings, the largest Chinook salmon in the world, are already fished heavily by sport and commercial fishermen, and now this a giant step backward to gill nets for so-called subsistence. And he's got that in quotes. My feelings are a mixture of outrage and helplessness. I imagine that rape and burglary victims must feel the same way. Gill nets in the Kenai. I'm going to skip down. I'm not alone in my feelings of sorrow and loss. Many others have strong feelings about it. The issue of subsistence fishing has driven a destructive wedge into the heart of our community, and I am sick at the thought of it. One sixty-foot length of monofilament gill net isn't the cause of my anger. No, it's only a handy target for it. To my chagrin, I even find myself despising the natives who sued the state for subsistence fishery. That, of course, would be the Dedina. This is not a feeling I know well, this hatred. I have never felt this way about Alaska natives before. I don't like myself uh, very well for feeling this way. But the feeling is there, and it will ex and I and it will express itself. There were maybe maybe fifteen people gathered around the gill net when my wife Janet and I went there this afternoon. I was looking for Indians, someone on whom I could focus my rage, but the people there looked just like any other Alaskans. I felt vaguely disappointed, even though I had known there would be no dark-skinned Aborigines dressed in animal hides and speaking in their own language. These people were my neighbors, and many, if not most of them, live in houses much nicer than mine, and I and have newer cars and much higher paying jobs. These modern day natives somehow irked me even more. Why were they being given special privilege when both the Alaska and United Nations United States constitutions 
have provisions against such feelings, privileges, such privileges. Well, that's a sport fisher talking and uh, gives you an idea of the contentiousness of the time. As you might know, might expect it went to court. After ongoing litigation, the Federal Subsistence Board ruled Kenai Peninsula towns not rural by eliminating, eliminating a federally mandated subsistence priority. So today, uh, no Cook Inlet tribes have full subsistence rights for fishing, that I know, with the possible exception of Nanilchik, um, as other parts of Alaska. So subsistence is massively misunderstood. Some think of mis subsistence as the writer, as welfare, uh, uh, but it's not. It's tradition. It's carrying on traditions of your ancestors. Uh, technology has little to do with it. You're not. You don't have to do it the old-fashioned, old, old way and dress in animal hides, and live in any chills. Modern subsistence has to do with uh, the taking of food and the sharing of food that are at the core of a uh, community. So it's been a big fight for the Denina, for the Kenaichi. Uh, they're still fighting. They're still dealing with it. So the subsistence net still being operated. 60 foot feet of net causing so much pain and anguish. Just uh, less, uh, far less than a tenth of a percent of the fish taken in Cook Inlet. The personal use fishery has grown immensely, and that's another dimension of the issue. So here's the personal use fishery. This is the Kenai. People come from all over Alaska, literally, to engage in that personal use fishery. Uh, there were thousands at the mouth of the Kenai River. Some say 20,000 engaged in the personal use fishery at the mouth of the Kenai, bigger than the town of Kenai, this past summer. A form of subsistence, really. They call it a personal use fishery only because of the emotionally charged subsistence fishery. But it's the same thing. Uh, that was established in 1990. So let's talk, uh, finish this up and talk a little about salmon management. Um, this, uh, this is data for the Kenai River Sockeye Run and this is for the Little Susitna Coho Run. Uh, this is escapement totals. So the management of the streams has been, uh, has been a remarkable story for uh, the Cook Inlet area. Uh, pioneered by people like Al Davis, Tom Nambet, Nambet, Ken Tarbox, and others using sonar counting to, uh, to determine escapement and then uh, using models that are known as Ricker models, mathematical models, to estimate uh, a sustained yield harvest of those fish. So uh, William Ricker in 1954, he was a biologist at the University of British Columbia, devised this mathematical model for you who don't like math. Uh, we won't go through this whole thing, uh, but it's a mathematical way to determine optimal fishing. So uh, on the lower graph here is a model of spawners, in other words, escapement. So this is escapement down here. And this, uh, on this graph, on the y-axis, will be the fry, the little fish that uh, will emerge, uh, that will hatch and emerge uh, to go out to sea and come back again as a result of the number of spawners. So if you have too few spawners, you'll have too few fry. The same token, if you have too many spawners, you'll have too few fry. Because, let's go back across here, because they'll eat them, they'll outcompete themselves. So there's an optimal point here 
where you have the right number of spawners to generate the maximum number of fry. And that's what this management is all about. Now this, I believe, is the traditional Ricker model. Uh, it's been modified since in a couple of different ways. In fact, there's on the for the Kenai River, there's a sport fishing version of this model and there's a commercial fishing version of this model and they're not the same. So there's a little wiggle room here uh, according to your values. But uh, it is an attempt to create a sustained yield of uh, salmon, of wild salmon. Some of the last wild salmon streams in the world. In the world, most are gone. And so there's huge demands on those fish, particularly on the king salmon. Uh, and whether that'll happen with the other other wild salmon, I don't know. So we'll end with this. Uh, the various user groups, the subsistence users, commercial fishers, which there's drift and set net fishers. We talked a little bit about this reef history. There's the sport fishers, and also the guided trophy fishers personal use fishers, all the Board of Fish and related regulatory apparatus trying to figure out and trying to deal with how to maintain this wild salmon run that is so precious to all of us. And we can end with this particular slide here. This is my smokehouse. These are wild salmon. We want to be able to take this picture 10 years from now. We want to be able to take it 50 years from now. We want to be able to take it 100 years from now. Salmon, the, the, this most remarkable food resource that has sustained cultures for generations here. And um, that's a, a value that we have that we cannot let slip through our grasp. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening.